we're live. All right, we are live. Live as in live and in the person or on the show? On the show. Definitely yeah, not live yeah. in person. We're still doing the, the <laughs> Zoom-based video conferencing, social distancing. I've said, I think on the last episode, I'm, I'm missing the mics, my friend. I, I'm, I'm missing the mics. But uh, we have another episode of Through a Therapist's Eyes, where we invite you to see the world through the lens of a real mental health and substance abuse therapist. Being aware this is not the, uh, the delivery, not the discovery, the delivery of any therapy services of any sort. Craig, I'm super excited about this one because we have a we have a return uh, a return man, a return guest, a return friend, a friend of the show. Mr. Joshua Shea has returned uh, back to talk about uh, part of what we're, we're trying to do: the coronavirus influence topics. Would you say that's uh, what we're trying to do, Craig? Yeah, I think so. This is definitely relevant to that. I would say. Um, once again, I failed my, my research on the past shows that we did with Mr. Joshua Shea. Was it 65, 66 and 67. Boom. He rocks it, man. Well done. (laughs) Uh, now I'm, now I'm thoroughly embarrassed, Josh. (laughs) How'd you know that? That's impressive. I, I uh, actually went and had to check something, um, so I went to the YouTube page and uh, saw those were the two numbers. So I was pretty close. That was, that, that was like 20 minutes ago, so <laughs> I, I, and I'm stalking you. I mean, in, in, all, <laughs> all, in all full, you know, disclosure. Full disclosure. <laughs> yeah. Well, we love that you're a friend of the show, and, and we're really glad that you came back uh, to share with us. You reached out on a topic uh, and you caught us, you know, right in the middle of what we are trying to do, which is, you know, give some coverage to all the stuff that we're struggling about with, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Did you hear that's going on by the way? I I have heard about that. I keep, I keep telling my kids to go back to school and I keep asking my wife why she's not going to work um, because, you know, I've, I've worked from home for five years and uh, I'm, I'm good at it. And suddenly, you know, the rest of the world seems to be trying to, you know, want to be me. So they're all staying at home doing the work thing and, you know, whatever. If, if, uh, if that's what it's going to be, that's what it's going to be. I, I understand why people want to follow in my lead. And, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, so let me try to introduce you again for the folks that um, uh, have not listened to episode 62, 67, 65. What'd you say it was again? 66 and 67. All right. He spent some time with us there sharing about guys, his personal story, Um, being a recovering porn addict and the author of Addiction Nobody Will Talk About, How I Let My Pornography Addiction Hurt People and Destroy Relationships. That was released in January of 2018. But his next book at the time, soon to be released, but now is released. Holy cow. Congratulations. I want to hear about that has been released, right? The second book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Came out in December. He is a porn addict. Now what? And that takes it from the perspective of um, uh, primarily, I think a spouse, right? Of, of, yeah. Of- it's a, it's a Q and a with um, answering questions that spouses act, ask. Um, I answer them from the point of view of the recovering addict and uh, my partner, Tony Overbay, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, answers them from the point of view of the expert who has dealt with couples in the past. It's very easy to follow, like I said, Q&A format. That is a really neat concept, and I'm super glad that you're brave and courageous enough to share your story uh, about that. And, and, and that angle is one that I appreciate greatly because in the addictions field, we don't deal with the family side of it. So taking a, taking a ring at that is, is really, really cool. I, I appreciate that. So in review, he's appeared over a hundred podcasts, television, and radio shows, using your personal story to promote ideas that porn addiction spans all demographics and those with the problem should seek help before it's too late. As it has become his case, we chronicled his full story. I wrote it down right here in episodes 65 and 66 is what I wrote, though. We have a discrepancy. Anyway, prior to admitting addiction, Joshua was a prominent magazine publisher, all award-winning journalist, film festival founder, and politician in central Maine as his 20-year addiction was reaching a critical level in late 2013. Uh, Joshua made a, a major error leading to his arrest 
followed by six months in jail. The spoiler alert, I'm not going to talk too much about that. It's in episode 66, uh, but I put in bold letters here, sir. Now sober since 2014. Yes, yes. I uh, celebrated six years from alcohol on April 1st, and while I don't know the exact date, it was a few days before that for pornography, so I crossed those six-year lines on both alcohol and pornography since I've spoken to you last. That is super cool, man. As a clinician, it it just, it it does, uh, you know, special happiness inside me goes off when I hear people kind of crossing thresholds of recovery. Although for recovering people out there, I understand it can be actually a really dangerous time and difficult time. Um, I actually was working with somebody who just about relapsed. I mean, was pulling in the parking lot, going after the bottle on his 20 year sobriety date. I believe and, it. Yeah, yeah. 20 years sober from alcohol, a full AA member and everything, and he just about. So it's it's a tough time, but it's a it's a celebratory time, and, and it's it's absolutely cool. Um, Craig, do you remember what we're talking about tonight? I do not. <laughs> Pornography and the coronavirus. Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Let's get your cold take. Before, Josh, we jump to some statistics, though. We're not a statistics show. It is a, a really interesting fact of, of, of some of what you gave me on the pre-show notes and stuff, Josh. Craig, what do you take from pornography and the coronavirus and all the effects? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a cold answer. I know that it's gone up. I've seen some stories on it already. So, yeah, yeah I know that it's increased because of the virus and people being locked up at home. It's kind of a weird thing to think how we get caught up into uh, all of the negative coping mechanisms that we typically have. I mean, you know, buying stuff we can't afford though, that's actually out. Alcohol, uh, porn is certainly, you know, different drugs and pot probably is, is, you know, weed use has increased dramatically. Uh, Josh, what have you seen with the statistics, like I say, of the porn industry? We're not a stat show, but boy, well, you probably got specifics, yeah, right? Yeah, what you're, what you're finding uh, is really this is, a, this is a twofold story. First, there are the people who are stuck at home. Uh, if you know anything about the coronavirus, you know that it first hit big uh, in China, and then it moved over to Europe. And the three countries that were hit big were Spain, Italy, and France. And Pornhub, uh, in all their brilliant PR wisdom, decided, well, what we're going to do as a PR stunt is to give Spain, Italy, and France uh, complete access to our website, onto all of our member sections and premium and whatever that means, but giving them completely (laughs) Uh, you know, unfettered access. Well, what this did, of course, was since there's very little else to write about or talk about in the middle of a, of a pandemic, uh, this got a bunch of free publicity around the world. And essentially overnight, these three countries saw their traffic on Pornhub absolutely explode. Um, in Spain, it actually reached a high a couple days after this was offered of 57% more traffic um, on, a, on a given day than they had a year earlier. Um, in, it was a little bit lower in France and in Italy, but uh, it was kind of uh, right about 30, 35% for the first couple of weeks. When this pandemic went worldwide, Pornhub then decided, well, let's push it all over the world and let's give everybody in the world complete access to our website. And while I obviously have certain issues with the uh, content of what they present to the world. I have to give them props in that they present a lot of great statistics to the world. Um, I think in a lot of ways, their statistics are about bragging about how they're doing, but they do give us a look of the analytics. And, you know, for instance, in America, when they gave the unfettered access, um, it 
popped up to a high of about 24, 25% overall. Um, it has slowed down since then. We're now recording this five, six weeks into the pandemic. The average daily traffic is now 10 to 12% above what it is on an average day. But uh, perhaps, uh, you know, alarmingly is that with females in America, they're still seeing a 25 to 35% jump in traffic on Pornhub as far as Americans go. And you're seeing across the world, uh, and they break it down country by country, that it's anywhere between, you know, places like uh, South Korea and New Zealand are only at a three to 5% spike, while there are other countries that are still at a 40% spike in daily traffic. But traffic has not dropped anywhere on Pornhub. And I think that, uh, well, a lot of people mistakenly believe Pornhub is the number one porn site in the world, and it once was. It's, for the last six months, been ranked number three. And I think that we can probably extrapolate that uh, while they do have great PR, and while that probably does drive some consumers to the site, uh, their competitors out there, whether they're bigger than them or smaller than them, are probably seeing similar jumps. So we're seeing a double-digit increase overall of people who are using pornography uh, and at least in America, uh, the numbers of women utilizing pornography are uh, higher than they've ever been before. This flips, the other part of this story is that these porn companies are trying to attract new content. Uh, when you've got this many people who want to uh, uh, you know, look at the content, use the content, you need more content producers. And what's happening right now is that you've got just an almost unlimited supply of young adults who have been laid off from their service jobs and can't go get a job somewhere else right now. And if they're, you know, if they're not eligible for unemployment or unemployment's not cutting it, where can they go? Well, the porn companies obviously realize that they can get a lot of these good looking men and women to come on and become, you know, cam guys, cam girls. And you're seeing absolute droves moving to this industry right now. because really? the, and, the, and these cam companies, uh, so some of what they're doing, including Pornhub, um, they are increasing the payout to their cam models. Usually for every dollar spent on a cam model by an end user, usually half of it goes to the cam model, half of it goes to whatever the website is. A lot of these websites are now offering the cam model 75, 85% to come and be a model for them. On top of that, you're seeing this whole other uh, sub-industry pop up in the online pornography world, which is kind of being a passive cam girl, where you don't have to go and talk to people live one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to take off your clothes to anybody live one-on-one. -on -one. It's almost like a, 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 and there are a couple of different sites of these, and I'm not going to name them because I don't want to push them, but uh, there are these sites that are almost like a Facebook or a LinkedIn where you can go, you sign up, for these different models you like, and then you can just do a pay to play kind of situation where you can pay to see their photos or pay to see their videos. And they're not doing an actual live in person deal with you. And I was reading an article that I think was either in the New York Post, might have been the Times, it was about a week old now, talking about one of these sites in particular. And they talked to a couple of these women and they said that they are more comfortable doing that because they don't feel like they're true cam girls or strippers that way. They can have their boyfriend take the pictures or they can take them themselves and then they just post them and people consume them on their own time. What's happening with this though is that these women, let's say that you you tell your uh, guys who are watching that it's $10 a month to get your photos or your videos, um, What's happening is that a lot of these women uh, are choosing this option versus becoming a true cam girl, and they're flooding the market with this sort of softer core uh, uh, cam girl stuff. So, you know, they're not getting the $200, $300 a day that are promised to cam girls who use some of the bigger sites. These girls are lucky if they're getting $200, $300 a month, 
But what's happening is that their content is still getting out there. Their content is getting stolen. Their content is getting pushed to a lot of the free sites or other porn sites out there that, you know, uh, offshore, <laughs> non-reputable. Well, you know, suddenly you've got tens of thousands of women producing pornographic content that these people are stealing, putting up all over the internet. And I don't think a lot of these uh, men and women who were deciding that this is a good choice, you know, not to be a true cam girl or cam guy, but to do this more passive thing where people access your material when they want. I don't think they're recognizing that this is still going to be out there. This is still going to last forever. Just because you're, you know, not interacting one on one in real time with somebody doesn't mean that the content isn't going to be out there in perpetuity. So okay. th these are really the two the two pieces that the uh, porn industry, uh, especially the online porn industry, are uh, going after in the time of coronavirus. Yeah. Wow. So there's a lot there to unpack. <laughs> the first the first thing I'm I'm hearing is first of all the numbers. So when you talk about percentage increases, let's just realize. Uh, well, let me back up to Craig. I hope I didn't screw up by by not giving us a soft disclaimer. Uh, by the title, obviously, we're talking about pornography and the coronavirus. So uh, I don't think that this will get too explicit in any regard. Uh, you know, we're talking about it in terms of the companies and, and kind of what's going on. So I wasn't sure if I needed to give a disclaimer like we did uh, the show, the last show, uh, Craig or not. But but nevertheless, uh, be, be aware of your kiddos uh, listening and such. Um, the, the numbers per se of pornography use are high anyway. So just to point out the fact that when you've got increases, percentage increases of 20, 30, 40 percent or more, I mean, that's a lot. That's a big number. You know, 30 percent increase on 10 people is only, you know, three people. 30 percent increase on 110,000 people is a whole lot bigger of an issue. That, that's that's the first point that comes to my mind. Uh, the other is this whole area that you're talking about that I didn't anticipate or I guess realize at all is sort of people that aren't involved in the industry that are now suddenly involved in the industry. That's surprising to me. I want to hear more about that. A and B, what you, you, you speak of, maybe I'm showing my ignorance, cam companies. I don't really understand what that is. What, what is that also? Well, one of the uh, fastest growing segments of the online porn industry is, uh, you know, peer to peer cam. Uh, uh, setups where essentially uh, you can go onto a website as a consumer, uh, you are presented with 20, 30, 40 per screen. I guess it depends how you set up your screen. Um, you can, you know, decide what demographics you want if you're looking for men or women. And they'll present you with that many people on a screen and you can go page by page by page. And these are people who, like you and I are talking right now, are literally sitting on the other end of the computer waiting for you to give them some money and they'll do a you know, show you something, do a sex act, whatever it is that's agreed upon, uh, depending upon the, the different websites or the different setups. You know, sometimes it's communities, uh, users pooling their money together. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, people are there just to try to get uh, the consumer into a one-on-one -on -one, uh, private room where they can charge them a lot of money per minute. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely exploding. And with the fact that uh, there are, there is, it is exploding and there are so many new users, these companies need new performers. And for, you know, the youth culture, which kind of is a little bit desensitized to pornography, desensitized to, you know, sex and nudity, um, it seems like a much more viable option to a 21, 22 year old good looking guy or girl than, you know, being an actual stripper um, or, or doing any real porn. Um, it's all from the comfort of your home. You run the show, you stop the show, you do what you're comfortable with or, or not comfortable with. And uh, you've got these, these uh, consumers on the other end, sometimes thousands of them in a room at a time who will tip you and pay you to do whatever you've agreed upon. Um, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's like any other uh, chat website, except it involves copious amounts of nudity for money. <clears throat> Craig, what do you take from all that? Let me pull you into that because I I have not 
realized that or heard much about that or thought about how people are getting into this that never have because because one of the things that scares me is I, you know people will do a lot behind a computer screen they wouldn't do in real life to say to say the least so i'm kind of like you know what I, I'm, I'm i guess i'm just sh sort of shocked by that craig what have you ever heard of anything like that i have I, i'm not <laughs> to be honest with you yeah so I, I'm actually surprised because you know there was there was recently a, a giant uh, independent movie that came out called Girl that was a fictionalized look at this um, on the HBO uh, summer series Euphoria. One of the teenage female characters was like this. It is really now a regular normal part of youth culture. What's the name of the movie, Josh? You kind of broke out right when you said the name. The, of the movie, movie itself is called Cam Girl. Cam Girl, and it's on HBO. Uh, I, the movie is available anywhere. the The television show itself was called Euphoria. Um, it was on HBO this past summer, uh, kind of looking at uh, teens in Southern California and how you know their world is messed up in in 2020 or 2019, I guess, when it came out. Um, and one of the girls uh, who is a little bit overweight is a little bit insecure about herself. She finds. Uh, you know, a level of control uh, going on to these websites and finding guys who like girls who are bigger, who like girls who, you know, present what she can present. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree that it's, 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 it's told in both an empowering and a sobering light because it does come back to haunt her. Um, but it, yeah, for youth culture, for young culture, the world of cam pornography is as normal as the exotic dance stripping world that you know we know well, about, or or the the pornography movie world that we know about. It is it's one of those things, and, and again, it's 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 that's one of the reasons why I'm out here, you know, talking to people as much yeah. as possible, uh, you know, trying to use my story, but trying just to talk about the industry in general because there are so many things people don't recognize going on, especially with youth culture it's a little bit ironic that here i am a a pornography right. addict a young who, fella <laughs> uh, well I'm a, I'm a no i'm not a young fella but i'm a <laughs> pornography i'm actually getting white in my beard it's freaking me out for the first time <laughs> um, and uh i uh i was you know i was a pornography addict for years i stay away from the stuff now but as an educator and someone talking about this i have to learn about it and i'm constantly you know reading about this stuff and and talking to younger people and talking to people who you know i i, I advise online about this stuff and trying to constantly learn and i'll tell you the the scariest thing i learned today was that there is a website out there um i don't remember the specific name of it but they were specifically targeting female mcdonald's employees who have been laid off to come and become cam girls for them. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, the thing is, I, I can attest to that, Josh. I, I see that in my, uh, in my office. I do. Um, you know, the, there's a training that I went to on, um, you know, technology and, and social media with kids. Craig, if you recall, back in the day, it, it yeah. very much led to a lot of our, our shows that we did on social media with uh, uh, Dr. What's-his-name. Anyway, um, it just escapes me. They talked about kids as being technology natives, right? I think the three of us, judging by our age, we are not technology natives, meaning it doesn't come naturally to us. But our kids are growing up, and I've had them in my office. Man, they are, they are listening to, you know, porn, engaging in the movies. It's, it scares me what you're saying, Josh, because I can tell you, the parents have no idea, but they're like upstairs or in the bonus room and they're sharing their pictures and their bodies and their images with, with predatorial people, uh, right readily on the net off of your daggum Wi-Fi that's in your house. That that's happening. Would you, well, would you agree I, with that? I, I agree with that, but I'm not, and I don't say I'm not worried about it, but those predatorial people, there are such a tiny number of this. 
I, I'm actually a little, and those, you know, freaks are going to be out there forever. Uh, I'm almost more worried about the, you know, high school kids who this is just normal. So they're exchanging, you know, uh, nude videos of each other. And like 99.9% .9 of high school relationships, they go bad. And when they go bad, they get real personal. And suddenly stuff starts getting shared all over the place. Right. I was, I was, I was actually informing my therapist about some of these things the other day and she was sharing with me that I guess there had just been some uh, outbreak at a local high school of some guy shared his ex-girlfriend and stuff and it went around and they all kind of settled it uh, but six guys now have to go to uh, this, you know, have to have, have to go to therapy for the next six months as part of a <laughs> court ordered mandate. Yeah. Uh, that, and that none of us, none of these people really saw this happening. And, you know, I guess these guys are going to be told in therapy that this is the wrong thing to do. But if this is what the norm is, this is why we have to go after the kids and talk to them about pornography. You know, this is why we have to at, an, you know, seven, eight years old, we need to make it age appropriate, but we need to, we need to tell seven and eight year old boys and girls that, Hey, guess what? You don't ever let somebody take a picture of your private parts. And guess what? You don't take a picture of anybody else's private parts. And then you can leave it at that. You don't need to get into the history of pornography. Uh, you just have to, you know, share that with them the way that you share, you know, if you don't, if you see a cigarette laying around, you don't take, you don't take it. If you see beer around, you don't take a sip of it. Uh, you know, we let need me, to start me, doing that. Exactly. Let me highlight that a little bit, man. That, that is a really good thing for people to be thinking of as a, as a, as a total takeaway, probably from this show. It, it really is a responsibility of, of parents primarily to provide a certain amount of, um, you know, safety training. It, it, it's a vital component of, of guiding a young person. And you'd think your 13, 14 year old ki kid is, is more knowledgeable than you. They kind of are because they're, again, they're technology natives. But the reality of it being is that, man, you, you, you've really got to teach safety about what is, what is private, what is not, what you do if somebody, you know, appropriate touching, inappropriate touching, who's who's allowed to touch your body the sanctity of all that i mean starting at what age i would say quite young we need to really be kind of gearing into um safety teaching to our children that that's a, that's a big thing i hear you talking about oh absolutely and i i just i think that uh it's something that we we need to recognize is happening and we can't rely on what we think we know and we can't rely on things like uh internet filters because if if, if you're using an internet filter um you know I, I i just informed you about these campsites that have been around now for six seven eight years if you don't know to block them well they're still out there and you know i think that filters are wonderful tools to make parents feel better that they're doing something. But, uh, you know, I, I have to ask my kids about what the apps people are using today are, because, you know, you and I, we talk about Facebook, we may talk about Twitter or Instagram. They got off those five years ago, and they're using other things that we may never hear of because they may never hit the full mainstream. My you son know, reminds that me all that all the time. He's like, Dad, nobody uses Facebook, man. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, right. their parents and grandparents do, so they don't want to be there. So they have a hundred other things to do. I mean, for instance, with Instagram, uh, a lot of people don't recognize this, but you can create an Instagram account within an account yeah. and have it locked. Or you could have multiple accounts that only certain people can get at. And you're, while your dumb parents think that you've got this one account and you're questioning yourself, well, should I allow them to put that bikini photo on there? I don't know if that's appropriate. Uh, They've got triple X stuff on their other account that you know nothing about. And so as, as parents, I think that if you want to uh, try to stop your children doing this, what needs to happen is that you need to have them make the best decisions possible and that's only going to come from feeding their head with knowledge when they are four or five, six, seven, eight years old. And, and you can make it a little bit more specific and even, you know, technically a little more graphic as they get older um, and a little more, you know, porn centric, I guess. Um, but it needs to be in, in 2020. It needs to be part of the conversation. So let's go down through a couple of these, man, and, and see what what specifically is kind of going on with them. I was intrigued by your. Uh, I, okay. 
before we go too far away from the topic, so like taking pictures of, of each other and sending them around, um, where do the legalities get involved with that, Josh? I was listening to Joe Rogan the other day, and he was talking to somebody, and this, this topic came up, and Joe said that this girl who was underage took pictures of herself, sent them over to her boyfriend. Somebody found out, and then she got in trouble legally for distributing child pornography. So what do you know about that aspect of it? They've, the, the, there have been uh, uh, judgments, depending on how far parents wanted to take things or how, how far DAs wanted to take things. There have been judgments all over the place. There are uh, you know, guys and girls who have created their own pornography um, and distributed their own pornography of themselves and have got in trouble with the law. Um, and got in some pretty good trouble with the law. You know, there are there are now, uh, you know, guys and girls who are on sex offender lists for life because they've done this at, at, at such a you know young age and made a mistake, thinking that they were you know just doing something you know kind of, kind of innocuous because that's the way it's sort of presented to that uh, age group. But yeah, it's 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 absolutely illegal. You know, you can your not exempt from yourself. You cannot take pictures of yourself naked and if you're underage uh, and send them to somebody else because then you are distributing underage pornography. I'll tell you what's kind of interesting uh, and I, in, in, is that states, some states use age of consent as the rule for you can do this or not. And some states just use the overall 18 year old, uh, you know, line of adulthood uh, demarcation. So the laws from state to state are absolutely all over the place. And the way that different DAs, judges, police, and, you know, parents are gonna deal with this are all over the place. There is no consistency to it. The, you know, the, the best thing in the world is obviously for the child to not create the pornography. Um, this, this, this sadly isn't recent. I think it was three, four years ago now that I read a statistic that said, you know, only one fifth of the child pornography being made in this world is being made by adults. The rest is being made by the kids themselves. Whoa, wait a wow. minute. Say, say that again. One fifth of the child pornography that's being produced, created, generated is done by adults. Four fifths are made from kids themselves. Yes, and, and, and I'm sure it's the, you know, absolutely most depraved, violent, sick stuff that the adults are making, uh, you know, and a, lot, and a lot of that stuff is, is imported from Europe, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think it would scare us right now if the number of guys and girls who are in their room, who are under 18 years old, who are taking photos of themselves or doing something that they shouldn't be doing online right now, if that number popped up in front of us, I think that we would all probably, uh, uh, recoil in terror um yeah. because how much is you know the, the amount that's out there is absolutely uh you know ridiculous yeah that, that's a scary reality honestly i i, I again tech I'm, I'm pulling together the idea of uh you know technology native people that are that are younger they're they're just way more comfortable with this they're they're way more aware of what's going on and engaging in stuff that is super dangerous to them as you said the permanency factor of this all going on and 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 i guess it's it's a little surprising to me with the the covid pandemic how that sort of you know creating a, a bit of a swirl where people are sort of swirling into this thing and getting really um really maybe uh, getting activated and turned on upon not intended into the the quick buck that can be get from this you know what well, are the long-term effects of this stuff i wonder well and, and think think of it this way um Right now, the the uh, best statistic that's out there, or scariest statistic that's out there, when it comes to men between 18 and 30, uh, comes from the Barna Group, is that 32 percent uh, have said that they either have a problem with pornography or that they believe they have a full-on pornography addiction. So let's just say one out of three guys between 18 and 30 have a pornography addiction. Now you take these uh, Pornhub statistics. Uh, let, in America, let's say, and then all of a sudden, you know, let's say it's only 10% more use of uh, pornography through Pornhub than there has been in the past. Still, with that 10%, you're talking about three out of every 10 guys 
who are now utilizing Face or, or uh, Pornhub who weren't utilizing it in the past are likely going to become addicted to pornography. I mean, that's going to be one of the long-term effects, I truly believe, uh, of the COVID virus and of the coronavirus is that these people who become hooked on pornography because we're not equipped to deal with this, they're going to be porn addicts in 20, 30, 40 years. They're going to, you know, they're going to find that whatever reason porn scratches that itch it still scratches that itch when we all go back to work and go to the restaurants and do, you know, res resume whatever the normal life is going to be. You know, it's not all of a sudden, well, this new addiction is gone. That's not the way, unfortunately, it works. But just looking at Pornhub's numbers and looking at numbers of addicts, you can see what the damage is going to be. You know, I, th I think I can maybe comfort you a little bit in that, honestly, or, you know, cre run some clarity a little bit in that regard as a substance abuse professional. We, we talked about this actually in the first episode 65, I think, where, um, you know, uh, what is addiction is the, is the discussion there. We had a long, lengthy conversation about that, which I think was, was really productive because we know that scientifically, genetically based, basically, that there's about 10 to 15 percent of our population that is addicted. And that, and that has a pretty long, uh, well-established uh, static number. Uh, now, people that are abusive, people that are destructively doing, you know, weed or alcohol or uh, now pornography, uh, you know, that, that number, I hope, addictively is going to be about the same. Now, destructive use, whole nother story. Terrifying reality. Also, the issue of cross addiction. Now, there's a lot more pornography, sexually based activity with people that are actually thinking they're in recovery, not realizing that porn and, and sex addictions are real, fall into relapsing with that. So I see, so I see some comfort. I don't think it's going to explode, you know, exponentially addiction per se, but the mannerisms of acting out and, and who gets involved in it destructively that, you know, that's a whole nother ball game. That's, that's going up. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that does make sense. Um, and and I, I definitely hope you're right. Um, I just, you know, l like I came on here last time and said, I just, if we don't start dealing with this, uh, you know, these guys who are 30 become 40, and then they become 50, and then they become 60. And, you know, if the numbers keep moving in the direction they are, it's not going to be 32%. It's going to be 36% of 18 to 30 year olds, and then 40%. Yeah. And what does a world where one third of your guys and one quarter of your women who are porn addicts, you know, what does that look like? And at a time like this, you know, when everybody's stuck at home and can't do anything, you know, hey, mom's not minding the cookie jar. I can go get as many as I want. Um, I just, I, I really fear that uh, we're going to, uh, not, nothing good is going to come out of this this time with the virus. Uh, it's only going to make things worse, and it's only going to make things worse in the long term. I I guess that's uh, job security for all of us, but it is, it's not a, it's not a good it's not job a, security. It's, it's not a great thing for society in general. No, not at all. I mean, it is it is it, it, it's it's why we were are doing these set, set of shows because I think people are not thinking about as much though it's gotten a little bit of play the, the mental health and substance abuse side of this stuff joshua I've, I've kind of been telling people you know colleagues and such especially like I, I feel like mental health and substance abuse professionals are on the front lines you know with these issues uh you know direct care doctors and nurses and such are our team one but but we're team two because this stuff is really i mean lots of suicidality lots of terribly harmful things in the in the long run are are you know in depression and anxiety i mean it, it, stuff is just exploding with all the mental health and substance abuse factors and this is one sort of Things caption of that that say again yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot of things that we should be doing. We're not. I mean, you look at, for instance, uh, all of these uh, schools that are passing out school lunches. They should be passing out a piece of paper that has all that has a whole bunch of mental health, uh, you know, options on it as well for domestic right. domestic Point. abuse options. Uh, all these different things that are happening out there, and you know, there are horrible things happening. Domestic abuse, like I said, is up. Drug use is up. Drinking is up. Um, and all, you know, th these types of things, you know, are all trying to share space 
you know, with headlines that we haven't have never seen before because we're living through a friggin' plague. Whoever thought that would happen? I know. Oh my gosh, I know. I did want to go down, uh, Craig. Craig, I, I don't want to dominate. But you, you thinking anything? Let me check in with you and see what you're hearing about. Well, you know, I just uh, just the things you guys are saying just go back to that whole thing about, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys saw the interview with Dr. Phil the other day, but he was on. Um, the Fox news channel. And he was arguing, we need to kind of get back to work, get people out of the house. And because the long term of being locked on this lockdown and shut in is going to be worse than the virus itself. And he got a lot of flack for that, but man, it just what you guys are saying just kind of solidifies the fact that I think he was right. You know, we got more domestic violence, more, more pornography addictions, more people drinking suicides. People can't, um, people can't feed their families, feed their kids because they're out of work. I mean, the, the long-term effects of this sounds to me like, in my opinion, are worse off than the, the short-term staying at home. And I don't know how you guys feel about that. I'm, I'm real mixed because I'm not a medical expert, Craig. I know I, I, I worry very much about all of the child abuse and, you know, that's not even mentioned in, in, very much in domestic violence, you know, uh, you, you know, it's, it's a difficult give and take. I actually, I actually heard of, uh, hey, I can make it public now. I've actually heard of, uh, have you heard of the hammer and the, the dance is a current metaphor kind of going around on no, how to manage no. this. Well, the hammer, the hammer is, you know, shut down, stay at home, you know, boom, the curtain drops and, 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 and that's because there's so many deaths going on. The dance is where you, you know, we're, we're entertaining this conversation about getting back in and, and, and going to work and, and doing some things. So I have actually thought for at least a couple of weeks now that we're really, you know, to be ideal with the way that we have internet communication and, and worldwide reality is, uh, you know, we can, we can kind of coordinate really in maybe an ideal way where we're engaged in the world for two weeks and then we shut down and shut back for two weeks and then we kind of go back in for two weeks. Well, this is what they're describing actually now with the hammer and the dance. So, so it allows for some of the mental health like relief to, to, to just get out and function and be with people. I mean, dude, I am missing shaking people's hands. You know, I mean, I'm missing, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I want to go and give my mom a hug across town. And I'm not, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to get her, I don't want to get her sick and, and infect her and whatnot. But, but to bring it back to our, our topic here, I mean, you know, in lieu of not having that human connection that is so important, Josh, I think people are turning to porn. Well, and, and I, I mentioned this before we started recording, and I put a you know a little bit of a joke of it up on LinkedIn today, uh, where I said, you know, I've been working from home for five years. I need the rest of you to go back to work because I live vicariously through you. Yeah, and, right. And, but what I'm actually, and, and I'm somebody who I, I have figured out how to work from home. I figured out a balance. Um, I, I do actually notice how much more I went out than I realized, just simply bringing my son to school or picking him up in the afternoon. That was two times a day that I had to get out. Um, so I, you know. Oh, that was a big Zoom loss. Recognize it. All right, Josh, we uh, we got we a okay big here? Zoom break. No, we had a big Zoom break. We lost you. I don't know where we lost you, but go back. Okay. Uh, you said you got you, you said you got out of the house twice a day to get your kid. There you okay. go. Okay. Okay. So I I you know would leave my house twice a day to get my son. I don't do that now. So I recognize there is some change in my life, but the change in my life has been very minor compared to most people. I look at LinkedIn it's up on my screen most of the day. And, you know, I've made a lot of good friends like you guys through LinkedIn. And I've got to tell you, most of my uh, connections on LinkedIn are in the mental health professional community. And it's losing its mind. It's going crazy at home. Yeah. I can watch just so many more videos of people drawing with their kids and talking about how great this time is at home, where I can tell they don't think that's what the case is. And, you know, everybody's a wonderful musician, and I appreciate everybody's new front lawn. But it's clear that there's, and, and, and I'm sure it's true with other sectors of other industries, but just watching all of these mental health professionals who I 
witnessed, you know, for months and months on LinkedIn in their normal lives, they're going stir crazy. And, you know, and, you know, guys like you probably have a better handle and self recognition when something like this is going on yeah, or going on, on to people around you. No, not necessarily. We are people too. We have emotions and, and to be honest with you, your, your observations are absolutely correct. I mean, people are telling me, you know, telephone therapy is, you know, as a clinician, that is, that is, it's very draining to be so focused and to, you know, over a limited venue or a limited scope such as that. We hopefully have a little bit of a heads up, practice what we preach. But the point that I'm trying to make is when the emotion comes home, when the emotion is in us, when it's our thing, it is very much equally so difficult to handle. And Josh, I think that's why you're seeing, you know, all the mental health professionals being stir crazy and having a lot of the same questions and doubts. I mean, listen, when you're dealing with your kids at home, frustrated and mad at you for having you being forced to do the math, you know, sheet, we are too. We're just a parent and they're hating us for it. <laughs> it's it's yep. it's all so very tough, which again, to bring it back, you know, are people moving towards porn as a release? Uh, are they moving towards that as a coping mechanism more so than normal? And I think the answer is yeah. Yeah, well, just look at look at Netflix. Look at a few weeks ago how big this Tiger King show was. I have I barely watch Netflix ever. Um, I, I just don't watch much TV. I, I do other things. Um, and I was bored and I was like, okay, let's find out what this is about. So it's, I, I'm always at home and I watch this stupid show for the, you know, and watch something on Netflix for the first time in years. And so everybody's watched this crazy ass show for the first, you know, and, and everybody knows about this because it's the communal thing that we can do at home together and what's a, something we can do at home by ourselves well we're all looking at porn and that's that's what i fear is that you know there are so many people who they're not going to talk about it in in you know the way that they talk about watching tiger king but you can't tell me that this many people would have watched Tiger King if they all weren't all locked up at their house. No, probably not. <laughs> and now, be, and they're all locked That's at funny. their house. And what, what do you so watch? We'll watch when, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, what do you watch when Tiger King is over? Well, there's an unending supply of porn out there. And if you're willing to watch something as crazy as Tiger King, maybe you're willing to try other venues and other areas of things you don't normally look at. Um, I also worry about people who are porn addicts already who are getting even more restless. What happens to a porn addict or somebody who you know uses a lot of porn who is stuck at home now i have a feeling like with most addictions that's probably escalating faster than it would have been it's probably getting into weirder areas more extreme areas potentially even more dangerous and, and legally questionable areas well let's let's talk about that and move on a little bit in that i wanted to kind of focus a little bit on well, what is the harmful effects of porn uh how, why is this such a bad thing before we kind of go there so get uh, the three of us the two of you get your get your brains kind of centered on that a little bit do we want to mention anything about these specific companies kind of what's going on you, you, you we started off with Pornhub a little bit um in your in your promo josh you mentioned a few companies and i didn't even know what they were but i guess i want to say is there specifics that are interesting or important for people to know, such as you mentioned with uh, Periscope, and, and I don't even know what that was, a subsidiary of Twitter uh, dropping its monitoring of live videos. That was crazy. Uh, webcam sites, I guess you were talking about that, uh, you know, in the webcam models and stuff. Uh, and coronavirus pornography is the latest genre. What, what are these things that people need to know, probably particularly the, the dropping of the live video monitoring streams. Well, that, that has actually that has actually come back, which I guess enough people complained, so they brought it back. But Twitter yeah. has a Twitter has a subsidiary called Periscope, which is uh, I guess Facebook Live would be the, the closest thing where you can stream and um, a lot of people can watch you stream at one time. Um, and it's it's a it's a popular app. Um, uh, you can get it on your computer as well. They have always done a huge job of monitoring. They allow nothing that's even borderline PG-13. A couple of weeks ago, they dropped all of their monitoring. 
And suddenly what was a very well regulated space where you could go and, you know, and, and see these different people from around the world talk about different things. A lot of companies used Periscope to share information uh, that suddenly you've got uh, the Wild West. And suddenly you've got, you know, the red light district in Amsterdam or, or Bourbon Street. Uh, you've got people you know, doing whatever the hell they want on there. And while I don't think that uh, Twitter or Periscope were making any money off of this, I think what it, it's a brilliant move to get people to go towards the uh, app itself or to go towards the website itself. At some point, you reach a critical mass of people who are going to use your app. Well, if you can radically change something about it, like, hey, instead of it being rated G or PG, it's now going to be rated you know, whatever you want, is, you know, broadcast whatever you want, that's going to get a whole lot of new eyeballs to it. And, and you know, they, they have reinstituted these, uh, these monitoring and the, this, the moderators are back, but you can't tell me for three weeks, it was just a, uh, it was just a coincidence. And there were people who were on there saying that, well, I bet it's because of the COVID virus that, you know, Twitter had to send all of its Periscope employees home. And it's, what would be the easiest job in the world from home than being an online content moderator? Uh, you know, okay. you, you should never go into the office for that. That seems like the easiest job to do from home. But they stopped doing that for several weeks. And obviously money and views and eyes were behind that. And it shows that uh, while, you know, they used sex, they used pornography uh, as a tool to drive eyeballs. And that's, you know, that's just another way of showing how companies can utilize sex, pornography, and whatnot uh, for their advantage and not be a quote-unquote quote, you know, uh, online porn provider. Wow. Do you think that's why they stopped monitoring it, Josh, for that reason, for, for pornography? I can't. Well, the thing is, why did they have monitors in the first place? It was to get rid of the pornography. I mean, I can't believe that that many, you know, murders were taking place online that they needed moderators. They were moderating specifically for nudity and for sex. And when the moderators disappeared, all the sex and the nudity came back and it was there for a few weeks. Um, and there were people online who started complaining about it. And yeah, you know, I've read several articles from uh, websites about it and suddenly it came back. Um, I went and I'd, I'd never actually used uh, Periscope till I'd heard of this. And I went and looked at it and it was like, Oh my God, this is ridiculous. Um, and I'm glad to hear that they've got those, those monitors back up there. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I can't see, any reason that, gee, 80% uh, of the world is staying at home now. This is a great opportunity to capture more customers. Uh, what is the one thing that we can do to capture more customers? We can stop moderating. And realistically, it's even, no matter if you care or not, um, you're probably you've got other things on your mind than fighting this. I mean, that's one of the things that I think a lot of these companies are using in their favor right now is that we all have 101 other things on our mind. You know, how can I, how can I really condemn the, you know, McDonald's worker who wants to, you know, flash their butt online to make a few extra bucks to make the rent <laughs> when you look at the world we're facing right now? How can I condemn that person? Well, it's still not a good choice, but, I, I, I feel bad condemn, condemning that person um, because of what's happening in the world. Yeah, and I think a lot worse things are going to start happening, you know, the longer this lockdown thing goes on. Um, dude, when people get desperate, when they can't eat or feed their kids, man, stuff's going to start happening. So, yeah, you're right. You can't really sit in judgment of somebody who's just trying to feed themselves or their kid or whatever. Right. Not to judge uh, and, 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 and condone or whatnot, but I do, do want to, you know, before we run out of completely out of time, uh, I want to kind of focus us a little bit on what, what is destructive about pornography in the first place. Not necessarily from a sex addiction perspective, because Josh, I think that's a little bit different, a little bit more involved, but looking at it more from probably a vast higher percentage of people that are engaged in pornography, what, what is it that is uh, troublesome about pornography in the first place? I, I, have, I had listed out a couple of my thoughts, but um, why is this bad in the first place? Let me ask you two guys. Why should we care? Why are we worried about it? 
Well, the answer that I always go back to uh, is, is this. And I know that people can use pornography without becoming addicted. Uh, people can drink without becoming addicted. People can gamble without becoming addicted. Uh, but here, and, and there are these genres of pornography or movements in pornography of ethical pornography or pornography made by women. And, uh, you know, Never that, heard that, that term, ethical that, pornography. Ethical is pornography. Definition. And that, that try to put a spin on the creation and distribution of pornography as somehow not this uh, evil white male dominated, uh, you know, uh, man, you know, viciously attacks a woman, you know, sexually and all. But the fact is there is no pornography that has ever been produced that doesn't reduce another person to just a sack of body parts. Right. There is no pornography out there that does not simply reduce somebody to objectification. And ultimately, I think whether you're the person on the screen uh, who is doing it, even if you're enjoying the money at the moment, or you're the person, uh, who, uh, the user who is objectifying that person in the short term, uh, it's going to dawn on you that's what you're doing, hopefully. Uh, and that's why pornography isn't good, because it's just simple objectification, and that's not healthy. Yeah, I, I get you, and that, that is a big piece of it. Um, Craig, you want to take a stab at that? Do you have thoughts about that before we... Yeah, kind of go to some of the things I listed and thought out. About why it's bad? Yeah, why, why is it a big deal? What's a big deal, someone might say. Why, why do I got to worry about this? This is, you know, this isn't, a, that isn't hurting nobody. I'm doing it all on my own anyway. You know, I wanted to spend a little bit of time. Yeah, what, what destructive nature does it really have? Well, I think it's probably just like Josh said. It's demeaning, you know, demeaning to, uh, to mostly women, right? I mean, um, but, but, but beyond that, I really don't know. I've, I've heard people like I follow Ben Greenfield quite a bit. And I've mentioned him on the show before too. And he says that, uh, you know, it's bad for the mind and the brain, but I've never heard Ben talk about why. I don't know the, the specifics of that. Well, you're going to love this then. Um, I kind of did my own brainstorm. Let me tell you how, how I developed this. I, I did my own brainstorm, listed a couple things. And then like, I haven't done this in a while, Craig, but I have a, you know, a little pop a little Google search and see, see what I came up from. But you'll see on the show notes, please check that out because the psychology today article I thought was fascinating. It speaks directly to that. My own thoughts were, you know, unrealistic nature of developed belief about a woman's sexuality. You know, it's not real Put people that are young and, Evidently, people honestly that are our own age and are older get an unrealistic belief about true women's sexuality. Uh, you know, some would say that it's full blown cheating. You know, it, when you're actually engaging in, in pornography, some would say, well, you cheated on me. Uh, whether you feel that way or not, it, it's something that could be create a perception in your spouse or in your partner's uh, view. Getting needs met outside of the marriage is uh, something that marriage therapists don't like to hear. You're getting your your needs met either physically, sexually, or, or emotionally as well. Cause these cams, Josh, I would imagine people are developing relationships and getting, you know, regular customers or whatever. I, I don't know, but I think that probably happens. And then uh, emotional distance gets created, but listen to this, 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 this article in psychology today made my brain kind of pop a little bit because they, they highlighted some of what you were talking about. What did you say? Greenfield? Talked about yeah. that, Craig? What, yeah. what did you hear him talk about? You know, I, I listened to Ben for years, and I don't remember what he said specifically, but he did say he, he said it was bad for the brain or bad for the mind. I can't remember exactly what Ben said about it, but he's not a fan. So they this is paraphrasing and, and a little bit of conclusion on what these guys were talking about, but plenty of people out there, including teens and preteens, with highly plasticity, highly plastic brains, right? So they, we, we grow and we change, our brains change. We now know that. They find out are compulsively using high-speed internet porn with their tastes becoming out of sync with their real-life sexuality. That I mentioned. But this is escalating compulsion. So in the first ever brain study on internet porn users, Josh, you might be interested in this article, I would bet, which was conducted at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin, actually. Researchers found that the hours and years of porn use were correlated with decreased gray matter in the regions of the brain associated with the reward sensitivity, as well as uh, reduced responsiveness to erotic still photos. So there's like a disassociation 
between sexual desires and their responses to porn. Users may mistakenly believe that porn makes the most aroused and is representative of their true sexuality, but it's not, right? So it's also uh, not by coincidence, they point out, then that porn users report altered sexual tastes, so less satisfaction in their relationships, real life intimacy, and attachment problems. All that stuff kind of blends in together, but it's, it's fascinating because as we learn about the limbic system and the brain and the gray matter that all of our endorphins are racing through and whatnot, this is a pop, like you say, Josh. It, 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 it attaches to that itch, and it, and, it, and it changes literally the way the brain is functioning. Now, some would argue, as we learn more about addiction, that can lead over into a biological you know, addiction reality. I, I'm skeptical of that, but I am skeptical at all about the fact that you know, when we do destructive things, it is changing literally our brain. This is why, by the way, in a positive way, Craig, you're, you're, you're talking a lot more about you know, deep breathing and yoga practices and meditation. We can change our brains to the positive as well. But when we're hitting the pornography, guys, we got to understand that there's a biological impact here. Josh, how much of that is new? How much of that is did you know? And, and what are you hearing with that? Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I absolutely believe that. I have heard uh, similar things. I, I perhaps have even read that article. I've read so much, I can't keep it straight anymore. Right. Um, but what, I was, what was hitting me was uh, two things that I've heard recently, and I don't think I shared either of them in, in the uh, last episode we did. Just tell you quick here, I was talking not too long ago to a uh, woman who is a counselor at a, in a health clinic at a college that I, I won't name, but one of the things she does is she holds different groups uh, for men and women uh, who are students there, and she has a, a sexuality group uh, of women uh, who discuss different things. These women, mostly freshmen, sophomore girls, they specifically do not want to take a guy's virginity these days because guys who are having sex for the first time tend to be far more violent than guys who have been doing it for a while because they believe based on the porn they've watched based on the media they've watched Uh. that they want that, that, that women want them to be dominant women want them to be violent women want them to take over take control to be the alpha male and these women who are in this group uh, of of uh, this this uh, little group therapy or, or group sessions that this other uh, counselor holds has said that they specifically do not want to be with virgin men because wow. of the way that they view sex these days. Yeah, that that's fascinating because I mean again we know you know you view this stuff it's not real people I mean any adults you might think I'm silly but adults that are listening to this it we need reinforced with the idea that this stuff is not real. But it's it, it freaks me out, Josh, to hear you say that that women are not wanting to take men's virginity because they're they're thinking they're going to act like a porn show, and I'm, I don't want that. Yeah, that's remarkable. Well, and they've clearly experienced it. Right. If 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 right. they don't want this, that they've experienced it. And yes. I I mentioned the HBO program Euphoria earlier, and I really I urge parents to watch this. I would urge adults to watch this now. I watched it and I thought this can't be legit. This has to be very dramatized. And then I've seen so many uh, teenagers, especially those in Southern California, talking about the drug and the sex climate there uh, among the youth culture. And they say that it's dead on accurate, which is scary. And in one of the first episodes, one of the girls goes to take a guy's virginity and the exact same thing happens where he immediately grabs her by the throat and she's like, what are you doing? Oh what are you doing? I thought, uh, this is, I thought this is what you like. And it's like, no, it's not. And uh, I'm not Pamela Anderson on Pornhub, dude. No, right. no. And, and the other thing, the other thing is, and I'm, I won't, I won't get graphic here, but the two things that men respond and have responded for pretty much the last 25 years that they want to experience sexually is, is number one, a, a threesome and number two, anal sex. And if you look at the statistics of men who actually have experienced this, they are very, very low. Less than 30% of men have ever had a three-way. Less than 15% have ever had anal sex. Yet, if you look at pornography, if you look at the attitudes out there, if you look at, you know, these are the things that guys want, they don't happen. They're not realistic. Women don't want this stuff. 
but it right. perpetuates and it's perpetuated now for decades that these are the gold standards of what you want when it comes to fantasy or the things that you can actually have happen when it comes to fantasy. Yet the statistics show they don't actually happen very often. They, they aren't going to be out there. I think any guy who probably has ever asked a girlfriend uh, or whatnot for these things have found this out. Yet it's kind of perpetuated out there, this myth, this fantasy, this, you know, gross misconception you know that that that's part of it is it's this gross misconception that pornography is what real sex is like and now that every 13 year old boy has an iphone in their hands they can watch the most depraved stuff 24 7 and because of the elasticity of their mind believe that this is indeed what sexuality is and this is what sex is going to be like when i become 18 or 20 or or however old they are and yeah. they go they go into it absolutely programmed incorrectly she's programmed way incorrectly yeah that's that's uh yeah that's i, I thought that was fascinating because we know that the brain can kind of you know the pleasure centers change and uh, we can change them for the good, though. I want to I want to end this little section on that though, to realize that, you know, we can reprogram our brains and get into healthy sexual relationships and, and healthy ways of dealing with our with our stress. So let's taxi in. We got to go uh, and wrap this up. So I wanted to wrap it up. by, you know, how do you positively cope with stress? How do you how do you positively manage this? Uh, the stress that we're feeling with the COVID-19 and that type of thing. Um, so. I'm sorry. I don't know if you can hear that. My son's trying to call me. Uh, so let's let's get um, let's get into what do we do for fun, man? Craig, I am dying to get a hockey game, a handful of peanuts in a hockey game. I can't do it. So what are we going to do instead for fun? What, what are we going to do to to deal with our stress appropriately, guys? Make your world look better. Fix your house up. Paint a room. You know, go, you can still online shop, buy a new bedspread. You know, when you can't fix things on the inside, sometimes the easiest do is to fix things on the outside. I got to tell you, I am i am absolutely looking forward to tattoo parlors opening back up in Maine. I can't <laughs> wait to go get one. Uh, you know, and I, I haven't, I haven't got one in a couple of years, but I want to go get one now uh, because it's just time for a change. It's time to be different. And I'm pretty cool with who I am on the inside. So let's change something about the outside. Got it. Like it. I, my lawn has had some 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 mulch put down and some grass put up, and I finished my gate at home. I have cut a, a, a more of a tree down, and it's it's my lawn's looking pretty good. I agree. Craig, what are you doing for fun? How do we deal with stress? Uh oh, we can't hear you. Are you muted? You muted yourself. Yeah. So I would, you know, I would say start trying some new things. I mean, we talk about meditation and we talk about yoga and stuff like that on this show. I would, uh, you could start doing one of those kind of practices. You know, I know we're supposed to stay indoors, but it's a great time to get out, go for a walk, go for a run, pick up some exercise in some form or fashion. There's lots of uh, body weight workouts that you can do. It's a great time to declutter. You know, I'm, I'm going to do some decluttering around my house, my garage and my, my bedroom and, uh, there's lots of stuff that you can do. I mean, that, that goes kind of along the lines of what Josh is saying there with fixing things up. Um, pick up some new books, you know, there's, uh, pick up some new books. There's tons of resources on uh, the internet now where you can learn new skills. You know, there's a website called udemy.com and they've got thousands and thousands of different kinds of training courses. You know, you can pick up a new skill. I mean, there's just tons of stuff that you can do now. It really is. Uh, you know, Listen, we got to get on out of here. Uh, Josh, if you remember from episode one, you didn't do a whole lot of personal sharing this time. I really do want to refer people to episodes 65 and 66, uh, if I'm right about those numbers, or if you're right, 67 to 67, 66 and 67. You'll see them out there. Uh, we do a high five when people are sharing. So you have shared. So here in a few seconds, we're going to do a clap that symbolizes a high five when I'm live with people that are sharing because it is a courageous thing what you're doing, man. I, I really appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate how you're going about it. I appreciate you reaching back out to us because to get back on uh, was with a great idea. It was such a, you know, it, it was, it's perfectly timed. So on the count of three, we're going to clap here. One, two, Josh, you and me, we're clapping. Okay, we're clapping. I'm, Symbolizes uh, a high five. Okay, okay clap. <laughs>
Hi, five. <laughs> you well, you got to get this on video. There it is. Yeah, we're well, we're, we're recording, but not showing the the, the video. But uh, because, like I said, you know, it's a uh, high five. I like the one signifying, you know, what you're doing out there. I think we're supposed to. Party. I think we're supposed to elbow bump. This here. is true. Well, we're yeah. virtually we're clapping and vert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tapping tapping feet nowadays. Yeah, yeah. God, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. Josh, take us out of here, sir. We're going to let you take us out of here with your closing thoughts. How about that, Craig? Does that sound okay with you? Sounds good to me. Well, I guess, uh, you know, it's very similar to what my, my thoughts were last time and my thoughts will probably always be. Um, while we didn't get into my story this time, I was the last person in the world that you thought would be a porn addict. I had on the surface, you know, great job. Uh, I was a, a local politician, family man, kids, wife, whole nine yards. I hid my pornography addiction for 22, 23 years until it got too late. Um, if you think you have any type of pornography, issue, or if you think you have any type of addictive issue, get help before it becomes too late. Because the end story with addiction is it always becomes too late unless you get help before that. So do the smart thing, do the wise thing, do the brave thing, step up and uh, get yourself some help if you think you have a problem. Dude, that is super well said. Appreciate that. Guys, we're going to keep on a coronavirus theme for a little bit here. Help us get through all this mess. Stay safe out there. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.